Hey everyone, Anthony Morganti here. Today I'm going to talk about my favorite black and white application, Silver Effects Pro 3. Today we're going to be using Silver FX Pro 3 as a Lightroom plugin. It also works as a plugin in Photoshop and Photolab 5 and it works as a standalone app as well. We're going to be working on this image. Uh, I'd like to see what this image looks like in black and white. I already have done some processing in Lightroom on it. You can see there's some basic processing there. I also gave it a bit of a crop. At this point, I'm ready to send it into SilverFX Pro 3. And to do that, I'm simply going to right click right on it and go down to Edit In and then over to SilverFX Pro 3. Now, when you do that, because it is a RAW file, I have to send a copy of this RAW file with my Lightroom adjustments. That's not a limitation of SilverFX Pro 3. When you use it as a standalone app, it will work on RAW files. But when you use it as a Lightroom plugin, a limitation of Lightroom is Lightroom will not allow you to send any RAW files directly into any plugin. You have to convert it to another file type. And that recommended file type is TIFF. The color space by default will be sRGB. Now usually I put Profoto RGB in here, but since we're converting it to um, black and white, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> so. Uh, Profoto RGB isn't going to be any better than sRGB in this instance. 16 bits per component. Resolution, I think by default, 240 will be in here. Um, most people recommend you put 300 in there. If you own an Epson printer like I do, Epson recommends that you use a resolution of 360 throughout your workflow. But with all that said, it really doesn't matter what you put in here. You could put one in here and it's not going to make any difference. So don't get too hung up on resolution at this point. Uh, worry about it when you're ready to send the image to a printer. Then, then that's important. Compression none. We're going to click edit. So you'll see in the top left hand corner there's a progress bar. Lightroom is creating that TIFF file with those specifications, sRGB, resolution 360, sending it over into SilverFX Pro 3. And you can see as soon as it opened in SilverFX Pro 3, two things. It's black and white already. And we have this dialog box that popped up, kind of a warning. Uh, things to know before working on a TIFF file. Since you imported images in TIFF format, you have the ability to resume editing later. Enable this option by clicking on the checkbox next to the image information. Okay, we're going to click OK here and get rid of this box. What they're talking about is this checkbox over here. It's already checked. Um, if you have that checkbox checked like I do right now, when I'm done editing in SilverFX Pro 3 and I go back into Lightroom, let's just say I decided that I moved a slider. I just realized I moved a slider in SilverFX Pro 3 too far. And I want to go back in and reposition that slider. If that is checked, I'll be able to do that. It will remember all the settings I just did in SilverFX Pro 3 and allow me to re-edit them. If it's not checked, when I come back in to SilverFX Pro 3, it's going to act like it's a brand new image and all those sliders will be reset and I won't be able to resume the editing where I left off. Uh, the problem or the bad thing about this is you're going to get a bigger file when you do this. So it says right here, non-destructive destructive edits larger files. So just be aware of that. Now, SilverFX Pro 3 on the left hand side are some presets, on the right hand side are all the controls. It's really simple. What I strongly recommend you do is find a preset first. A preset will get you pretty close. Find one, hopefully that will get you pretty close to what you want. That way it will save you a lot of time when you go over on the right hand side and start editing things. So um, I'm going to look for a preset. Now as, as I mentioned it's black and white already. What it did was it added this triple zero neutral preset uh, to the image and all that is is neutral. All the controls are pretty much zeroed out. Um, but go through the thumbnails, take a look at them, see if you see a preset through the thumbnail that you might like, and then click on it. And it will apply it. Now that one's no good. 
you can just go through and just apply some and see if there's one you like. That one isn't too bad. That's uh, full dynamic range smooth. That's preset number 16. Full spectrum. I don't like the sky already. I could tell it's too dark. Um, let's go with this art process. Let's see what that looks like. All right, let's, let's just, for the sake of time, let's say we're going to use this one. Now, I mentioned pick a preset that gets you kind of close to what you like, and I kind of like this. And if you go over on the right-hand side, you'll see at the top there is a loop. The loop will show wherever your cursor is over the image. Now, this will help if you want to look at something specific, let's say the lighthouse, but when you come off it, it moves. What you do is grab this little thumbtack, clip it on the lighthouse, and it will stay there now. And when I do my editing, I could look at the loop and see what my editing is doing to that very specific part of the image. When you want to um, remove the thumbtack, just click on it again, and then you could move around. Now we have a histogram. Um, the cool part about SilverFX Pro 3, it has the zone system built in. For those of you not familiar with the zone system, it was something that was created by photographer Ansel Adams, you probably heard of him, and Fred Archer may not have heard of him. The zone system is really a, just a system that they tried to use when they were exposing the scene and when they, more importantly, when they were developing their prints in the darkroom. They were trying to get a good represent, representations of all the tones in the scene. And they divided the tones up into 10 different zones. And you can see those are represented here by these little blocks. And you can see we go from 0 through 10. And technically, I should say, there's 11 different zones. As I was saying that, I knew I was wrong. Anyway, 0 through 10. So that technically is 11 different zones. And you could see when I hover over each of these little tiny squares, the screen or the actual image, uh, you'll see these diagonal kind of slash lines coming in. Those are the tones in the image that are represented by where my cursor is right now. And then I could go through. So you could come through and kind of see if you're representing all the tones that you want to represent. It looks like I'm representing all of them, every single one, as I come through. I thought I wasn't um, representing zone 10, but as I hover over it, I see right in here, there's some zone 10 in there. You can see. So that is the zone system. I encourage you, if you're really into uh, black and white photography, is to look up the zone system. Uh, Ansel Adams has a book on it. I'm not sure if Fred Archer does, but Ansel Adams definitely has a book on it. So, you know, that check that for further reading. Now, um, below the histogram and the zone system, we have the actual adjustments. And they're pretty self-explanatory. First of all, they're global adjustments. So when I do these adjustments, they're going to affect everything in the image, everywhere in the image. For example, highlights, I could bring those down, let's say. Um, Midtones, I could open those up. You could see, now you could come back up to the zone system and see how it affects your zones. Now, I don't want technically that, but we're going to bring the highlights down a little bit, open up the midtones a little bit, or maybe bring the shadows down a little bit. And dynamic brightness, um, so you can see as you move it to the right, the image gets brighter. But the dynamic part of the brightness control means it won't clip your image. It won't blow out the highlights when you move it to the left, or to the right, I'm sorry. And it won't crush the shadows when you move it to the left. It'll just bring things right to black and right to white and won't do much more than that. So we'll move that. And below that we have contrast, regular contrast. And the preset did add some contrast to it. We could amplify the whites or amplify the blacks. So a lot of these kind of these controls, they kind of overlap a little bit, you know, because the midtones, highlights, and shadows adjustments messed around with that as well. Soft contrast, as the name applies, it's kind of um, supposed to be more subtle, but I found it's kind of an odd thing. You can see how it kind of, when you move it, it applies itself to different parts of the image. So you could move that around. Below that are structure adjustments. These are eh, make it look sharp. Be careful here. You don't want it to make it look too HDRE like I'm doing right now. It's really got a real strong HDR look to it. So I might want to dial things down just a little bit. 
shadows again. This one's a little more subtle in blacks. This is, of course, the structure in the blacks, the structure in the shadows, fine structure. Okay, I'm going to jump back up now. Typically, what I do is I do jump around quite a bit uh, throughout the image because I'll start adjusting something and it kind of undoes something that I adjusted a second ago. So I kind of want to go back and readjust things. Now, tonality protection. Um, if you find that your adjustments are adversely affecting the shadows, move this to the right and it will kind of pull the adjustments you just did away from the shadows, but leave it on the midtones and highlights. And similarly with the highlights, it will pull the adjustments away from the highlights that you just did and uh, just leave them applied to the midtones and shadows. So those are the global adjustments. They affect everywhere. Now below that are control points. Control points are really cool in that you could affect a very specific part of the image. For example, let me grab a control point by clicking on it, and I'm going to click on the lighthouse here. When I do that, you can see we get this circle. I call this the area of influence. I want it to just affect the lighthouse. As a matter of fact, I want it to just affect like the bricks of the lighthouse. So I'll pull it down, and what it does is right where I place this point, right in the middle, this, this little point right here, it looks at the the tonality and texture and on the color version of this image it also looks at the color that was in the color image right under that point and then anything that is within this circle and matches that texture tonality and color it will only allow you to affect it so then these uh, these control points you could see uh, down here we have now a bunch of adjustments for those and they'll only affect the lighthouse. See how they're only affecting the lighthouse? Now it does kind of spill over a little bit onto let's, you know, the sky. You just move it around, try to get it so it just affects what you want it to affect. Um, so we'll, we'll just reset that. I didn't want brightness all the way down. But I'm just kind of giving you an idea of what this does. Uh, find structure is probably what I want to do is add some structure to that. Uh, you could do selective colorization and bring some of the color back if you wanted to. You see how it's bringing the color back into Lighthouse? I don't want that. So if you're into selective color, uh, you could do that here as well. So that's it. You could lay down color. These control points, you don't need the, the one control point. You could lay it down on you know other areas as well. Just just grab another control point, lay one down on the sky over here, and then you could do adjustments for this control point um, independent of the other control point. You could just jump, jump back and forth between them by clicking on them right here. So we're back to that control point. Go back to this control point two that I did. And, you know, let's say I wanted to add structure to the clouds over there. Now, if I wanted to make it like bigger, I could do that, of course. But if I wanted to add it over here as well, just hold the Alt or Option key and Alt. If you have a PC option, if you have a Mac, and drag it, and you'll drag out a second one. So that's a real time saver. You don't have to um, go through each of them independently or add them independently and readjust them. You could just hold that Alt or Option key and drag out another one, and it will have the same settings as the original one. Now, I don't want those last two control points, so I'm going to delete them by clicking on this and going back to that second one and deleting it as well. And those are, you know, the control points. Really powerful, and it's a unique feature of um, the uh, NIC software. Uh, all the different plugins have control points, and they really do allow you to adjust very specific uh, parts of the image. So um, I think what we'll do is we'll have a video in the future where I go a little more in depth in control points because there's a lot you could do there. All right, so we'll go back to the global adjustments now. We're done with that part. We did some control points, some selective adjustments. Now below that we have what's called clear view. It's a single slider. You can move it to the right and you can see how it affects the image in weird ways. Uh, this is something you just want to try. Move it around, see if it does something that you like. Um, below that, 
is a color filter. Now this is like the black and white mix that you might be familiar with in Lightroom in that um, we know there's a lot of blue in this image, right? So if I click here, um, you're, you, you're able to adjust just the blues. Anything that was blue in the image get, will get adjusted. Now, of course, I'm not going to do that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to turn that right off. So you could affect um, specific colors in the image with the color filter. Film types, you could emulate different types of film. It has some film built in. You go to this drop down, and if you want a, the Kodak ISO 32 Pan, Pantam, what is that? Panatum, I can never could say that word. But anyway, if you want to imitate that, you may. Um, Ilford film and so on. I don't want to do any film types, so I'll turn that right off. If you want to add film grain, you can do that as well. It has different types of film grain emulations for different films. You can, of course, try those as well. You just hover over them and you'll get a preview. I don't want to do any film grain. And finishing adjustments. You could give it a color tone. You go to this drop down and you can see different split tonings you could do to the image and so on. And I don't want to do any of those specific tonings uh, to the image. You could add a vignette. Uh, to the image now since i use this as a lightroom plugin i'm going to do the um vignette there if i want one uh you could burn the edges you can see kind of just another type of vignette and image borders you could put different types of borders on it i'm not into that so i'll leave that off and i think i'm done so i'm going to click apply now, since I used it as a Lightroom plugin, it's going to process this image, this TIFF file, and it's going to bring us back into Lightroom. And then we'll have our black and white image there. Okay, and there we have it. I have it right next to the color image. There's the color version of the image, and there is the black and white version of the image. That's SilverFX Pro 3, my favorite black and white application. Thank you, everyone who watches my videos. I really do appreciate it. I'll talk to you guys soon.